Hi everyone. Hey. Welcome to this uh, tutorial on opinion formation in social networks. Okay. So yeah, this tutorial is presented by um, us, Aris Ionis and Stefan Neumann from KTH, Sweden, and myself, Bruno, from Queen Mary University of London. Uh, we're all here in the, in the room, so you can talk to any of us if you will. Uh, so yeah, let's get started, I suppose. I will be probably checking the chat once in a while in case there are questions and so on. Maybe we cannot stop too much to answer them, but feel free to ask and I will do my best to answer some questions quickly. Otherwise, there will be uh, a break in the middle and um, perhaps some, hopefully some time left for Q&A at the end. So yeah, let's jump in. Okay, just a note to the assistant, I keep getting these, uh, these messages asking me to admit people in the waiting room. I suppose that you can take care of this, but otherwise, please let me know in the chat because, yeah, they're slightly annoying, but not too much, not a big deal. I'll take care of it. Okay, thank you. Cool. So, yeah, let's start with the motivation for this tutorial. So, opinion formation uh, has been around for a long time in the scientific literature and there exist several classic works in uh, social science and economics and so on uh, trying to uh, uh, define models that explain how people come to uh, conclusions uh, how they change their opinions when they communicate with each other and so on and usually so they would propose these simplified models of agent interaction right like like uh, like this uh, this graph here um so you know maybe we consider uh, individuals to be nodes in a graph and then they interact with certain individuals so this means that we would add an edge between them and maybe we represent their opinions as being uh, numbers real numbers or binary numbers or something like that and by by some simple dynamics they they change their opinions so okay this is a little bit simplistic but uh, interesting from an academic point of view but uh, so yeah you can say that this is not very re realistic and not very applicable to the real world but you know if you look at how uh, social interactions look today, then it, it looks like these models become a little bit more relevant, right? Okay, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit of, a, of a joke, of course, so social interactions are not exactly like this, but uh, to a certain extent, these models are more applicable uh, today than they were back when they were conceived. So yeah, there's been a renewed interest in opinion formation uh, in, in uh, recent years and in, in all of science, but uh, also in computer science, which is what we are most interested in. And we can speculate as to why this has happened. And okay, this is uh, what I was trying to communicate with the previous slide, which was a little bit of a joke, but actually there's some truth to it, right? Because now a lot of our interactions happen on social networks and these interactions are indeed quite simplistic in some occasions and the data that these interactions generate has become available in large amounts and so on. And studying these models uh, has applications in, in many domains like recommender systems, uh, marketing campaigns, political campaigns, and so on. Uh, and all, also there are some emerging social concerns involving these uh, uh, social networks and these uh, new forms of social interaction, like political polarization or teenage mental health and so on. So yeah, there, there's a lot of interest in, in understanding these models and developing them further. 
Um, so yeah, since the internet started becoming uh, uh, so widespread and social networks started to emerge, there's been a lot of interest in particularly the, the topic of uh, political polarization. And these books on the right are a couple of examples uh, looking at this issue quite a few years ago. So filter bubble republic.com. Particular here's a quote from republic.com. I will let you read it later if you wish when you download the slides. But considering that it was published uh, more than 20 years ago, it's a little bit eerie to see how accurately it predicted the um, landscape of information consumption today. Okay, so yeah, let's look at an overview of what we're going to see. We will first discuss some of the basic models for um, opinion information. So this the growth and Friedkin Johnson are maybe the most well-known classic classic models of uh, of uh, information, and then we will see some variants um, which have been developed on top of those uh, basic classical models or with different approaches, and then we will talk about some algorithmic aspects. And intervention, so how we can uh, inter interfere with a social network to maybe moderate opinions and influence people's opinions and so on. Okay, so let's start with the basic models. So the first one is the growth. Um, so yeah, this model considers a weighted graph modeling a social network. Okay, and we have weighted edges, which represent the influence of uh, of a node on another. So nodes are here people, and uh, the, the edges represent whether or not one person influences another, and the weight is the extent of the influence. And people here have opinions, so each node i is associated with an opinion xi. Uh, which is a number in the interval zero one. And we have a process, an iterative process by which people update their opinions. And this is simply by taking the weighted average of the opinions of the neighbors, okay? So this, this little formula right here is uh, that. So uh, the node i will update its opinion in time t plus one by taking its previous opinion from time t and um, uh, sorry, not, not its previous opinion, but its previous opinion, but the weighted average of the previous opinions of all of its neighbors. Okay. So to better understand this, let's look at an example. So on the left, you have again the update formula for your convenience. And here we have a social network where initially each of the vertices, each of the nodes, each of the individuals holds. Uh, the opinion that is uh, depicted by the number next to it. Okay, so this person thinks one, whatever that means, and the others think uh, zero. So we can iterate. Maybe you can try to predict after one iteration what will be the the opinion of each node. So, for instance, try to predict what will be the opinion of this node here to see if you understood correctly how this process works. So yeah, we take one step, and this happens. Okay, then we take further steps. And at some point, the process converges. So here, everyone now holds the same opinion. So this is a model of consensus, right? By uh, iterating according to the rules of the, the growth model, um, people in a group reach a uh, consensus. And yeah, this number seems it's, it's uh, in some way, it seems like it's a weighted average uh, of, of the initial opinions or something, right? But it's not clear exactly how we could uh, have predicted this exact number, but we will see how uh, very soon. Okay, 
So the first question that one can ask is, uh, does this always happen? So do we get a, a sort of a weighted average of the initial opinions? Yeah, sort of, but it's uh, it's not always clear that it's going to be, that they're going to meet halfway, right? You can think of some simple examples where something slightly different happens. So here in this very simple network, the process just results in the node on the left uh, um, changing their opinion uh, and the other one does not listen to anyone so yeah they don't always meet uh, halfway right and you know in other cases the process doesn't even converge so in this one for instance the process just oscillates between these two states right so these two nodes change their opinion constantly without ever converging. So yeah, we cannot say from that initial example that uh, we, we have the, that for instance, this process will always converge or that it will converge to some particular number. Uh, but let's see what we can say. Okay, so just so you start uh, trying to figure out how the convergence of this model works, we can make some simple observations. So recall what's the update rule. So we were updating the opinion of each node by the sum of uh, weighted sum of the opinions of its neighbors and dividing by the sum of the weights of the adjacent edges, right? And this is equivalent to assuming or imposing that the sum of the weights is one. So then for any of you who are familiar with um, stochastic matrices, you will probably have figured out already that, yeah, indeed this corresponds, this update rule corresponds to essentially power iteration with a stochastic matrix W defined just by setting every element uh, of the matrix to be the weight of the corresponding edge, okay? So yeah, if you have studied stochastic matrices, uh, power iteration, algorithms like page rank and so on, maybe you can, you have some ideas already of how this converges and when and, and when it doesn't. So, okay, let's uh, start with the first result about this. So assume that the graph is strongly connected. Remember that the strongly connected graph is one where each uh, vertex is reachable from any other. So this process, the decode process converges if and only if G is aperiodic. And what does aperiodic mean? Uh, it means that the maximum common divisor of the length of its cycles is one. Okay, so let's look at this. So for instance, let's look at our graph from before. This is the initial example and remember that it was convergent. So let's look at the length of its cycles. So we have a cycle here of uh, length 4, right? Here we have a cycle of length 2. Here we have a cycle of length 3. Okay. So yeah, already with uh, lengths 2 and 3, so these numbers are called prime, so the maximum common divisor is one. So then, yeah, it is aperiodic. So this is why um, this process converts on this graph, right? Okay. So if we modify it slightly, uh, now we don't have this three cycle anymore. We only have cycles of, of length uh, two and then four. So then um, we can run the same process as before and let's see what happens. So it oscillates between these two states, right? It does not converge. So yeah, our theory seems to be sound. Okay. So also from this previous lemma, you should be able to figure out an easy way to to fix uh, convergence, right? So, so to, to fix these oscillations. So of course, the way to 
ensure that the easiest way to ensure that these uh, that the maximum common divisor of cycle length is one is to introduce a cycle of length one. So yeah, if you introduce a loop, then this process will converge. Okay, it takes a while. Yeah, now it converges. Okay. So now that we know when the um, networks, when the process converges, it's interesting to try to figure out what's the value that it converges to. So what's that final number that everyone uh, agrees on? Okay, we can try to think about this. So remember in the beginning, I said, okay, it seems that this is sort of a weighted, weighted uh, average, right, of the, of the initial opinions. So we can assume that there's one such weighted average. So this x0 is the vertical vert, uh, vector, sorry, of initial opinions. And let's say that this uh, v is a vector of uh, weights of uh, agent influence, as we say here. So we take uh, weighted average of the of the initial opinions of the vectors. And yeah, we assume that the process converges to that for every node j. So since this process is convergent, we can left multiply by the matrix as many times as we want. And by doing some uh, easy manipulations under some mild assumptions that actually hold in this case, then uh, we can we have this identity and because of these mild assumptions we can conclude that v transpose times w is v transposed which is another way of saying that v is a left eigenvector of w with eigenvalue one so we can actually compute the final opinion the consensus opinion a priori okay by taking this uh, left eigenvector with eigenvalue one and multiplying it by the initial vector of opinions. Okay, but this applied to strongly connected graphs. So what happens if the graph is not strongly connected? Um, then it can converge as well, but the process converges even only if the graph is a periodic one restricted to every closed subset. So what does this mean? Uh, so a closed subset is a subset of the vertices such that no edge exits the subset, which is what this is saying, okay? So if a node is in this subset and there's an edge from some node, from this node to some other node, then this other node must also be in the sense. So, okay, we can uh, look at some examples. So we can modify our initial graph slightly by adding uh, this structure. Now we see that it's not strongly connected because if we make this jump, then we cannot go back. Uh, okay. And then this cycle here is of length so this closed subset is not a periodic. So then this process is not going to converge. It's going to end up oscillating between these two states. Okay. So this also tells you that just like it was very easy to fix a network so that it converges, it's easy to tamper with a network so that it doesn't converge by adding one such structure, okay? Okay, so yeah, that's it for the crowd. So now let's talk about the fritkin johnson model, which is uh, the, the, the next sort of the spiritual successor to uh, the decrowed model, so it, it modifies this model slightly. In fact, what the, what the authors proposed initially in their paper was a rather general uh, process of opinion formation. So again, we have a, a, an iterative process by which we update uh, an initial opinion Z by 
multiplying it with a given matrix W. But now we also introduce uh, another term of exogenous uh, factors influencing the opinion, which are these, this, this, this linear function of some vector S, uh, which might change over time, right? So yeah, this is rather general because you can accommodate many different uh, phenomena and dynamics uh, by considering um, evolving uh, values of these uh, variables, okay? But the common setting in which this is studied, studied recently, at least in the computer science literature, is this, this particular case where the weights of the two terms are one, so alpha and beta are one, and this, this exogenous uh, vector of opinions is actually fixed. So usually this is referred to in the uh, literature as innate opinion. So we consider that everybody has an, an initial vector of innate opinions and the vector Z, which evolves, is the vector of expressed opinion. The vector S does not change. So now this is the update rule. Notice how similar it is to the decode, but we simply have this added term S, which is fixed, it, it never changes. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So now we have a similar um, uh, network as before. So this is, recall the first example that we saw, but without this edge, remember that this has caused our process not to converge. Let's see what's going to happen now. So every every node has a, an innate opinion, which is this square uh, node here. Um, we give some values to these innate opinions. Okay. So now let's start the process with some values for the expressed opinions which are the values of the, node, the round nodes. And let's see what happens. Okay. I'm sorry, I skipped too fast. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is value at convergence. So now this network has converged. So even though the network of expressed opinions, so this part of the network corresponds to a non-convergent process. When we add these fixed innate opinions, the process converges, okay? So what does it converge to? So maybe we can do a little bit of math to try to figure this out. Okay, so we can write the first expressed opinion update like this. Uh, sorry, this is the general uh, opinion update. So the first update will be this, the second update will be this, and we can actually expand this and rewrite it this way. I'm going to skip a little bit fast over this because there's not so much time, but you can go over this later if you wish when you download the slides. And actually, if we generalize this process, this expansion, then we end up with uh, general update that looks like this. So we have this, this term, this uh, matrix power here, and then this expression, which if you, you might re remember from your linear algebra, that this uh, um, actually converges to uh, this, okay? So if you think about it, uh, so what this is saying is that the value of Z, the expressed opinions at convergence, only depends on the network, network structure, W, the weights of the edges, and the vector of initial opinions, okay? So the expressed opinions do not really have an influence. So let's uh, look at an example to convince you. So now we have here two copies of the previous network. You know that the innate opinions are the same in both copies, but we, we're going to start with different expressed opinions. So let's see what happens if uh, we iterate uh, these processes until convergence. 
they converge at the same values. So note that all the expressed opinions are the same, okay? Yep. So yeah, the final values of the Friedkin-Johnson uh, network depend only on the uh, values of the innate opinions and the structure of the network. Okay, let's look at other opinion formation models. So one objection to the Hroth and Friedkin Johnson is that they seem to be model of consensus or agreement in some form. So the Hroth, when it converges, it converges to this, everybody has the same opinion. Friedkin Johnson, it sort of brings everyone a little bit closer together in some sense, but this is not very realistic. We know that people do not always come to an agreement and sometimes they, after a discussion they might even become more entrenched in their uh, positions. So there has been an interest in developing mod uh, models that capture polarization or disagreement in some way. Okay, the most, most basic one probably is the bounded confidence model, which is essentially the growth but individuals only interact and update their opinions if the difference between their existing opinions is smaller than a threshold epsilon, right? So, uh, yeah, this, this model is openness to discussion, meaning that, you know, if, if, you, this, if you talk to someone who has a, a, an opinion similar to yours, you might uh, be willing to listen, but if they have a very, very different opinion, maybe you won't even bother listening, right? Uh, so yeah, larger epsilon produces consensus, while smaller epsilon produces polarized opinions. We will see some examples of how this happens. Um, so yeah, here we have an example of a very simple network with epsilon equal to 0.2. You can already see that some of these uh, nodes are not going to interact and update their opinions, right? So if we iterate this network, we see that uh, this node down here never changes its opinion because it, it was too far from the others initially but the others do interact and reach a consensus, okay? So this model becomes more difficult to analyze because of the nonlinearity introduced by these uh, thresholds. But okay, at least we can easily derive a, a, and, and state a sufficient condition for uh, consensus. So if we define this set, um, this set I, to be for so for each i, each uh, lowercase i, we define the, the set uppercase i, which is the nodes that are close according to this epsilon rule. And then this is sufficient condition for consensus. So if the intersection of these sets is uh, non empty for all pairs, then we will. Um, reach consensus. And here you have a couple of examples which illustrate both cases where we have uh, the sufficient condition for consensus and where we don't have it. This is not a necessary condition. It's a little bit to analyze. It's, it's a little bit more difficult to analyze and derive uh, necessary conditions, but this is a sufficient condition. Okay, and here are some simulation results. So for a graph where uh, we have a bunch of nodes with opinions initialized uniformly in the interval 0, 1, and for different values of epsilon, you get the behavior that you would expect, so more or less. So for a very small epsilon, we, we get that uh, the nodes do not interact, right, almost at all. So the network converges at, uh, by diversity of opinions. But as you increase epsilon, then the nodes interact more and they reach more of an agreement. And at some point, they, they reach consensus for some value of epsilon, okay? So, you know, this, this tells you that according to this model, if people are willing to discuss uh, a little bit, you know, they don't have to be open to 
everyone, but they can be open to those who are fairly close at the 0 0.5 distance of their own opinion, then um, they will reach a consensus eventually. Okay. More models, bias the simulation. So bias the simulation, uh, is this concept discussed in the social sciences and uh, famously by Lord and others in a, in a paper where they did some experiments to verify the, the phenomenon. And it's essentially what you may have um, heard of recently as confirmation bias. So is essentially the idea that you are more likely to assimilate um, evidence or information that confirms your your previous beliefs, right? And okay, there are some models trying to uh, capture this idea. One of them is this work by Dan Descartes and others. It's again, a small modification of uh, the growth but they introduce some factors in the in the update rule with some parameter beta which models uh, bias right so the extent to which you are biased in your assimilation of new information in your communication with others so values of beta larger than one will result in uh, polarization so people will interact and they will not be influenced by the opinions of of different people okay and it generalizes the growth because for beta, beta equals zero it becomes equivalent okay so to better understand this let's look at the simple example so we consider one agent so one thing about these models is that, is that they become much more difficult to analyze as soon as you start generalizing them a little bit and, and this will illustrate this so yeah if we look at this simplified case this particular case where, where we have one a single agent with opinion x this would be this round node here um, and it interacts with a fixed environment so it listens to this other node which has a fixed opinion okay it's this Square node never changes its opinion, and this would be the, the the update rule for it. So okay, we can look at various cases. We will set w to be zero just for simplicity. So w is the extent to which the node listens to itself, so to speak. We set it to zero for simplicity. Okay. So if we said remember that beta the parameter beta uh, quantifies the bias of this person so 0 0.1 would correspond to small bias this person is is uh, willing to listen to others so let's see what happens if we iterate this process so it's not very biased so it quickly uh, listens to the environment and, and changes its opinion to match the environment okay what happens if the Node is much more biased, but still not one. Not, it doesn't have a bias of one. So then let's see what happens. Okay, it seems that it's again getting closer to the environment, but it takes longer. So the same happens eventually, but it just takes longer. So what happens now if the agent is very biased? So it has a beta of five here. Yeah. Um, and it starts very close to the environment. So it has an opinion of 0 0.49, where the environment has an opinion of 0 0.5. Well, it very quickly goes to zero. So it does not tolerate even a small disagreement, right? And it becomes very uh, angry about hearing different opinions. Uh, let's look at other cases. So what happens if we start with an opinion of 0 0.9 and the environment, the environment's opinion is 0 0.1? We have a bias of 2. Then this process does not change. This is the equilibrium state of the system. What if we have an opinion which is slightly higher? then we converge all the way to one remember that one is one of the poles of the available opinion so we become 
completely polarized by listening to to this uh, this um, environment. And what happens if our initial opinion is slightly below 0 0.9, so it's 0 0.89, then it converges to the opposite pole. So yeah, this is a little bit uh, weird behavior. There are some interesting results in this paper, like they, they derive some uh, conditions for each of these behaviors in this in this particular case. But yeah, you can maybe come to your own conclusions as to whether or not this captures the bias assimilation effect accurately. Okay. Uh, um, later models trying to model this a little bit more accurately. Uh, there's this very recent paper by, paper by Chen and others, which is very interesting. So it also modifies the growth slightly, but it introduces this evolving, this dynamic term WT, which is defined down here as the product of the two opinions of the, you know, the agent who is updating its opinion and the agent that it's listening to. Um, and yeah, beta models bias. And this plus one is just to sort of uh, put things uh, in a, so that they work in a nice way. And the opinions are now in minus one one. So this is important because what is this representing? This is this represents whether or not the agents agree. Okay. So what's going to happen is if if you disagree uh, strongly with someone. So you have a large negative value of this product and you have a large bias, then this is going to throw your opinion in the opposite direction, right? So if you listen to someone who you very strongly disagree with, then you're going to become even more entrenched, entrenched in your position. Um, so we can compare the behavior of this model to the previous one we saw by Dan de Caret al. And so we have, again, a single agent in a fixed environment, and the single agent is this node in the center of the star, and the environment is these other nodes surrounding it, which have, they all have the same opinion among each other, and, uh, and we are going to assume that they don't change. And the authors of this model propose uh, an experiment well, where they uh, analyze the effect of one iteration of, of, of their model compared to one iteration of the previous model biased assimilation that we saw. Okay, the plot the results here. This plot can seem a little bit daunting at first, but let's break it down. So what they plot is the value of the opinion of node one in the center after one iteration as a function of its initial opinion and the opinions of the others, okay, of the environment. And you can see, for instance, that when you start with opinion zero in the previous model, which is this buff in blue here. So in the previous model, uh, no matter what the opinion of the environment was, uh, you wouldn't change your opinion. But in this new model in red here, um, you know, if if uh, your opinion is zero and the opinion of the environment is close to zero, it's for instance 0 0.2, 0 0.4, then you are willing to listen a little bit, so you you will uh, update your opinion slightly. But when the opinion of the environment becomes very far from yours, then you stop listening, and then you again. Uh, become entrenched in your position, okay? And then this works nicely along the, the whole two-dimensional plane. So yeah, this is a slightly more realistic uh, uh, model for polarization. Um, and yeah, this, this, this shows uh, essentially the same, and I'm going to skip it in the interest of time because we don't have so much left. 
Uh, a further model trying to capture polarization is a very interesting one by Hasla and others. So now the agents are not vertices in a graph, but they are vectors in RD, unit length vectors. And we consider interventions. So we expose these agents to some information, some other opinion vector v, and we update the the, the opinion of an agent u with this rule. So we just take the inner product of u and v, and we add v to u uh, in proportion to the value of this inner product. Uh, and then we normalize it to unique norm again. Okay, so this is meant to show how uh, by introducing uh, a little bit of certain value, certain opinion on some dimension in, in, in an intervention, you can actually reach polarizing behavior. So we will break it down, break this down in a minute. Okay. So for instance, consider an example where we have, we have 500 agents UI and they are sampled from the sphere uh, defined by this equation. So this means that we're going to have agents that look like this. They have some value, whatever value, uh, in the first three dimensions, but then zero in uh, the fourth dimension. So this could represent, you know, so three. The, these three first dimensions are the opinions on topics that people have in general, and this zero is the opinion that they have on on some. Uh, uh, it's a new product that you want to launch, right? So you could think of an intervention as uh, an advertisement, which has a, a strong value on the opinion of this fourth dimension, because this represents the opinion of your product, but it also has a small value in some of the other topics that people already have an opinion, on, right? So this is how the intervention will affect the vector u. And let's see what happens if we repeatedly um, follow this process. So here we have a plot of the vectors as sampled, as initially sampled um, in the first three dimensions, and the color represents the, the fourth dimension. So we want to see where they end up just by being exposed to these um to this campaign okay so if we take a few iterations note that they become very polarized with respect to the first dimension so even if the intervention was primarily meant to convince them about the fourth dimension your product just by introducing a little bit of value in uh, the other opinions um you, they can end up being polarized. So now I will go back to the initial slide and maybe you were wondering why I was mentioning something like this. So what this is trying to model is that if you have maybe advertising campaigns which are placed slightly with values in some political issues, maybe you, you could cause people to become polarized with respect to those values, even if it's not exactly your intention. Okay. Uh, yeah, just to finish, I would like to mention some models, uh, threshold models and cascade models, which are uh, models of information propagation, which are also very relevant to um, opinion formation. Uh, but yeah, I will I will just uh, mention briefly because we're running out of time. So they're just uh, models of activation propagation in graphs, which depend on whether or not you have a sufficiently high number of neighbors uh, active, or the independent cascade, mod cascade model, where at every iteration you flip a coin, and depending on the weight of the influence of each agent, you might adopt the opinion yourself or not. Uh, okay, so 
since we don't have too much time uh, left, we should have started a break already. So I will now give the floor to Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, sorry, everybody. because I took a little bit longer than I should have. So maybe you can decide if you want to uh, take the break or not. Yeah, maybe we can take like one minute break to like take a deep breath. Uh, yes, OK. And now, if anyone wants to ask questions, I will keep an eye on the chat. And since I'm not going to be talking, I'm happy to answer them in the chat if you wish. Okay, so I think we all had a very good deep breath uh, in through the nose, out through the mouth. That's uh, what they tell us in meditation. So uh, I hope we're all back and refreshed. Um, so for the rest of, so now we've seen models, um, different models. And for the rest of the talk, um, we'll be talking about the Fritkin Johnson model. And I'll uh, start. Stefan, do you want to share your screen maybe? Oh, you can't see it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, you should be able to see the screen now, I hope. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Um, OK, so yeah, I'll be talking about the Fritkin Johnson model uh, for the rest of the talk. And um, this is one of the models we saw early on. So. Um, we'll first talk about some of the properties of it. I'll give a brief recap. Uh, so we're all on the same page. Um, then I'll talk about some computational questions because so far we only talked about definitions. So I'll tell you about uh, computational aspects and I'll tell you about um, how we can use these models to understand the impact of algorithmic interventions such as timeline algorithms um, and how this is done by studying optimization problems. Um, okay, so let's start with the brief reminder of the FJ model. Um, so in this model, we were given this such, an, such a graph G uh, with, with edge weights W. And for the rest of the talk, we'll be considering undirected graphs. It just makes life a bit easier. And this is what uh, usually people consider in the literature. And so in this model, every user I had this innate opinion SI, which was kept private. Um, only the user themselves know it. Um, and then there's an expressed opinion ZI, um, which the user broadcasts publicly to the network. And um, these innate opinions are kept fixed for the whole time, whereas the expressed opinions are updated over time uh, following this update rule that we've seen before. Uh, so in every round, a user updates the opinion based on its innate opinion, SI, and the weighted average of um, its neighbor's opinion, its neighbor's opinions, right? Uh, so this was this update rule. And then we've seen that um, Bruno showed us a proof that if we take um, the time t to the infinity, this whole process converges to an equilibrium, which is given by this vector z star. These are the expressed opinions in the equilibrium. And z star is given by this identity matrix plus Laplacian inverse times the vector of innate opinions. All right, this is the brief recap of the model. Um, so you might say like, okay, but this derivation of the update rule, it might be a bit artificial. Like, why does it make sense? Is there like a better justification or just a different justification? Um, and so what you can do to get a different justification is the following. So for user i, you can consider the following cost function. Uh, which has two parts. So the first part takes the difference between the user's expressed opinion and its innate opinion 
squared. So this is like kind of the regret the user has for publicly saying something different than what they internally believe. Um, and then there's a second part, which kind of like uh, models the regret the user has by having conflicts with its neighbors. So we look at like for, for a neighbor I, we look at all of its neighbors J, um, and for each of them, we take the difference of their opinions squared uh, and we sum over this regret. Um, and so quite interestingly, if each user I sets um, their opinion in order to max, uh, in order to minimize this cost function, um, then we'll do, then we'll just, then this will give us exactly the same update rule uh, as above. So the update rule above is the minimizer for this cost function here. Um, and based on this observation, um, a very important paper by uh, Bindel, Kleinberg, uh, and others, um, it asked the question like, how bad is forming your own opinion? So we've just said like people want, like people set their opinion to minimize this cost function. Um, and when we look at this from a game theoretic point of view, this will converge to a Nash equilibrium. So what we can also do is we can define the social cost, which is just the sum over the cost functions for all of these users. And so we can ask like the selfish behavior given in the Nash equilibrium, how far is this away from the optimal social cost, which is like, which you can think of is like, would be good for society if we achieve like the minimum social cost. And what they show is that for undirected graphs, this is actually not too bad. So this ratio of like selfish behavior versus optimal social cost is just nine over eight. So we're actually not that far away. Um, yeah, so this is also called the price of energy. Um, but I should say this only holds for undirected graphs. For directed graphs, this price of energy can actually be much higher. Um, right, so we have this nine over eight ratio and here's an example. Uh, where this um, is tight. Um, so here we have like three users with innate opinion zero, one half and one. Um, and then in the Nash equilibrium, we see like the user in the middle is kind of stuck in the middle. So keeps um, expressed opinion one half. And then the, the left wing and right wing users, they go to opinions one over four, three over four. Um, but the optimal social cost would be achieved if they just move just slightly closer to one half. Um, and this is like a tight example where we see this nine over, eight, nine over eight ratio for like selfish behavior versus like optimal uh, uh, optimal behavior for social cost. All right. Um, now we have defined these equilibrium opinions set star. These are the expressed ones and we have these innate opinions S. And now we can actually use them uh, to study more um, complex behaviors in the network. And we can quantify um, stuff like polarization, disagreement, and so on. And this is what we're going to do now. So I'll now walk you through the definitions of like um, the measures that people are interested in when they study these models. Um, so the first one's like the most simple one, it's just the sum of opinions. So um, the sum of opinion just says like, we're just summing over all of the expressed opinions. And this, this is like a relevant measure if you want to like conduct a marketing campaign or if you want to do some rallying for some cause, right? Then from a societal point of view, the polarization index is like super interesting. Um, here, we are like first computing like the average user opinion. So we average over all user opinions in the network. Um, and then we take the square of differences between a user's opinion and this mean opinion. Right, so the polarization kind of measures this variance of the opinions. Mm -hmm. And then if we drop this like mean opinion, we get the, the controversy index, which essentially just um, measures like how extreme the, the opinions of the people in the network are, right? So in other words, this, is, this can be viewed as a measure of radicalization. Um, and as I said before, like if this average opinion set bar is zero. So if the sum over expressed opinions is zero, then controversy and polarization are exactly the same. Right. Um, the next one is quite similar to what we've seen in this cost function before. Uh, it's called internal conflict. So here we are summing over um, the differences uh, 
of expressed and innate opinions squared. So this is like the regret people have by saying something different publicly um, versus what they think internally. And this is just for the whole, defined for the whole network now. Then there's also the disagreement index, which takes into account the second part of the cost function we saw before. So here we are summing over all edges in the network. Um, we're taking like how much two, like two people who talk in the network, how different their opinions are, we square that and take and take like the, the weighted version of it. Right. So this is like the disagreement index, and it measures like the kind of tension that we have in the network, the, the amount of like conflict we have in the network. Um, and then finally, there's also the polarization disagreement index, which is just like the sum of polarization and disagreement. This can be viewed as like kind of a trade-off between polarization and disagreement that might be an interesting trade-off to study from a societal point of view, but we'll see later that um, also for like technical analysis, it has some pretty good properties. Okay, um, so these are a lot of um, um, a lot of indices here. You don't have to remember them by heart. So whenever I talk about them, uh, I'll show them to you again. Um, so yeah, it's just like a good list to come back to. Um, so now, interestingly, there's like there are strong relationships between these indices actually. So for example, uh, Xi Chen et al. They showed a conservation law of conflict. So they showed that if you sum uh, the internal conflict two times the disagreement and the controversy, this will result in the norm of the innate opinions. So in other words, if you think these innate opinions are fixed, then there's like a trade-off between these indices on the left-hand side. So for example, if you want to reduce the internal conflict, then you have to either bring up the disagreement index or you have to bring up the controversy. So there's really a trade-off. You can't just like make all like make all of these measures go down to zero. It's not possible. You you must somehow trade trade these measures off in the network. Um, so I think that's quite interesting. Um, right. And now we've so far seen these sums, but sometimes when studying these quantities, it's good to like look at them from like a, a matrix point of view. So um, most of these indices we can write down as quadratic forms. Um, and for that, we can exploit that we've seen that this equilibrium vector set star is given by this matrix inverse times innate opinion vector S, right? And then what we get is, um, are, are like these expressions. So these are like, uh, these are just equalities. So this sum here is given by um, the following quadratic form. And um, yeah, in these quadratic forms, I'm using one for the all ones vector. Again, I is the identity matrix, L is the graph Laplacian, um, and Z bar is um, the, back, uh, the mean opinion. Um, yeah, and this is like uh, quite interesting. Like, like this is like this can be useful for the analysis if you have these matrix forms. Um, and what's really good for the analysis later is that uh, like all of these matrices we see here, like also their products are positive semi-definite. Uh, so this this is like really a pretty good. Um, uh, good property because it means that we can use, like we can apply a lot of standard machinery we have developed in like convex optimization. Um, so it is like pretty good. Um, okay, so now this slide, it has a lot of text in the end, but it's like, you know, it's the slide, if you want to start working on this, it's just like nice to maybe come back to. So on this slide, I just put a few facts that I wish I had known uh, if, um, when I started working on, on, on this stuff. Um, but fortunately, uh, Sijing Tu, who's in the audience here, uh, she knew all of these facts and she was, she always generously told me about it. So, uh, yeah. So, um, first of all, I'll go quickly through the list. Um, so, um, like so far, we've often assumed that opinions are in the interval minus one, one. This is like kind of the standard setting. Um, then most of these, um, most of the indices we've seen before, uh, you can also like rescale them for opinions in the zero one index or minus a b index. So like the range of opinions, it's not super duper important except for the controversy index where the interpretation changes because for this um, controversy index, we're summing over these squares of opinions. Um, and then it's like really important whether the opinions are um, in minus one one or in zero one, for example, because like if you have low controversy, 
in the range of minus one one opinions, then the controversy is low if you have a lot of like moderate users around zero, right? Um, whereas for zero one opinions, um, like you still need for low controversy, you still need like everyone having close to zero opinion, but this means they are like to the left end of the spectrum. So for the interpretation, it's kind of like important uh, what you like. Um, yeah, then another fact, uh, interesting fact is that like this like sum of expressed opinions is always the same as um, the sum of innate opinions. Um, all right, there are a few more facts. If you want to look at them uh, offline when we upload the slides, uh, please feel free. I'm not going through them now because it would just be like too long list of technical stuff. Uh, all right. Um, so this, this finishes the part on the properties of the frame model. Um, so now we'll be moving to um, more algorithmic aspects and understanding interventions for moderating opinions. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, but first let's go from definitions to computations. So, so far we've seen like a lot of definitions of these like equilibrium expressed opinions, polarization and so on. Um, like for example, polarization here was this like variance of the opinions. Um, but in order to compute all of these quantities, we have to compute this um, expressed opinion vector z star. Um, and as a reminder, this expressed opinion vector z star, it was computed via this matrix inverse. But this is like problematic because um, like computing this matrix inverse, it takes two cubic time in practice. So it's like really slow. But even if we had enough time and compute resource to compute it, um, for connected graphs, this, this inverse matrix is like a dense matrix. So it has omega of n squared non-zero entries. Um, so even storing this matrix is often prohibitive. And this is actually what we see in a lot of experiments as well. Uh, this is kind of becoming an issue. Um, so the question now is essentially like, what can we do to get the Z star without computing this matrix inverse? Like, can we do this more quickly? Um, and then there's a really nice uh, paper by Xu et al. And what they observe is um, that Z star is the solution to a linear system, which is given by this, given by I plus, like then the matrix plus Laplacian times X is equal to S. So if you solve this for X, you'll get exactly the value for Z star. Um, and that's pretty good. Um, and then what they say is like, because it's the solution to this linear system, uh, then what they can do is um, then they can use like um, a generalized Laplacian solver, just like a very active field in the theory community right now. Um, and they can, and, and what they say is like, they can compute an epsilon approximation in O tilde of M time using this like black box algorithm. And based on this epsilon approximation of Z star, they can compute all of these quantities like polarization, disagreement, and so on in near linear time. This is orders of magnitude faster than computing this matrix inverse. So this is really like, if you want to like develop algorithms here, um, you'll most likely end up requiring like the ideas from the Xu et al paper. Um, I think this is like, this really has like made the whole area much more practical. Um, right, so now let's talk about interventions. Um, so like what we're trying to ask now is um, like how sensitive our polarization, disagreement, and so on to interventions. Like our whole network, if there's an intervention, what happens? So you might say like, what do you mean by interventions? Um, so like as an intervention, I see something like that's external to the model, right? We have this nice FJ model, and then there might be some internal, uh, some external force that like somehow changes the graph, that changes some opinions and so on. Um, so for example, like there might be a timeline algorithm that changes how people interact. So it kind of changes like the network structure of our graph and the FJ model. Or there might be an adversary who changes uh, the innate opinion, opinions of people by exposing them to fake news or by um, paying them money to change their opinion, for example. Um, right, so if we want to formally study such interventions, then what people usually do is they propose an optimization problem where the objective function encodes the desired goal, for example, like uh, minimizing polarization, and then the constraints of the optimization problem encode the power of the intervention. 
So it says like, what is the adversary, for example, allowed to do? What is the timeline algorithm allowed to do? So it's an example, here, like two examples here. Uh, the first one is like, suppose there's a social network provider like Twitter, and they want to minimize the polarization and disagreement by changing the network structure a little bit, right? So they, they, they change the timelines so that people interact in a different way. This changes the graph and they want to minimize the polarization. Another thing which people have looked at is um, there might be an adversary who wants to maximize the disagreement um, and has the power to, to take over K user accounts uh, maliciously. Okay, so then we can study what happens. So we always have this like objective function which looks at the, at the societal goal, disagreement, polarization, what we want to look at. And then there's the constraint which says like, okay, the adversary can change K user opinions. So this is like the general framework, uh, which I'll be talking about for the rest of my part of the talk now. Um, and now essentially, right. Yeah, I also want to talk a bit more about interventions, but okay, so before, after I talk about interventions, then uh, I will continue by just like, you know, like going through a lot of papers or like some of the most interesting papers um, which have like followed this framework of having an interesting objective function and studying a good uh, optimization problem. But then before we, before we look at these technical parts, um, let's first talk a bit more about interventions. So first you might say about this intervention part that I said like uh, tempering. So you might say like tempering with a timeline algorithm, it seems quite unethical. Um, and like, you're not wrong. I think it's like, it's, it's like a, it's like a tricky question, you know? And especially because like people are deploying such timeline algorithms in practice, we all know that, right? Um, so I should say that like when people study this in papers, then uh, typically they use simulations um, to see like the power of their interventions. So they like get some real world data with some real world opinions, but like their optimization problem, they do not solve on like real Twitter, but they just, solve it on their like data they have stored on that disk and they do not deploy it to like real world social networks. Um, and in general, like the goal of, like in my opinion, uh, the goal of this line of work is to really understand the usefulness and practicality of certain interventions. Um, and if ultimately we want to decide what is ethical in practice, um, we really need an interdisciplinary discussion, including philosophers, social scientists, policymakers, and so on. I think like, you know, in my point of view, we're the computer scientists in the room. We can tell, we can say what's like technically possible, uh, but we're not the ones who should say like what's ethical in practice. Um, but that's okay. That's like a long discussion. Um, another thing you might say, like when we study like adversaries, you might say like, okay, but it seems a bit unrealistic that an adversary can take over K user accounts and change their opinions arbitrarily. Um, yeah, I I kind of agree, but I think right now this is like a good. Um, this is like the most simple adversary we can try to understand. Um, and we first have to understand these like more simple adversaries before we can look at more complicated ones. And also, um, if it turns out that such a too powerful adversary has only limited power, the same will hold for weaker adversaries, right? So like this, like if we show something interesting for like a strong adversary, maybe it will carry or it will carry over to weaker ones as well. Um, so this is quite interesting, right? So here's what kind of interventions people have studied. It's just like, there are more papers about it, but um, this is like um, a selection. Uh, so um, people have looked at, for example, minimizing the price of anarchy, reducing polarization, um, maximizing the sum of opinions, for example, for marketing settings, or increasing the disagreement. And then the interventions, or constraints people have looked at is they said like, we can change innate or expressed opinions. We can maybe change some weights in the graph. We can change the whole graph structure. Different settings have been considered. And as I said, now I will talk about a few uh, papers that we see here um, and it will essentially be one slide uh, per paper. Um, right, so like one of the first papers in this line of work where they, can study, where they consider these um, optimization problems is by Aris et al. Um, and what they said is like, they want to maximize the sum of opinions. So again, this is just the sum over these expressed opinions. Um, 
And the motivation is like lobbying for a cause or for a campaign. Um, and the intervention they are allowing is that um, somebody can take over K accounts or K, K, K nodes in the network and set their expressed opinion to ZI star equal to one. So you can essentially make K users in the network the big proponents of the cause you're lobbying for. Right. And what they show is that um, a greedy algorithm gives a one minus one over E approximation. Um, and they, they show this by proving that the objective function is monotone and submodular. And from a more technical point of view, what they do is um, they could create like a graph, which consists of this like original network. And then every node is extended by this like boxy node here corresponding to its innate opinion. This is also the graph uh, Bruno has shown before actually. Um, and then what they show in this paper, it's quite interesting. It's like when you do an absorbing random walk where the absorbing states are the ones which are the boxes corresponding to the innate opinions, then you walk through the network and at some point you get absorbed, you don't get out of that state anymore. And with the probability of that walk, you assume the opinion as J where SJ is the state you ended up in. Um, then this equilibrium opinion that I star, it can be interpreted as the expected value when your random walk gets absorbed when you start at vertex I. Okay, so there's like this connection between these dynamics in the FJ model and these absorbing random walks. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, right, then there's another paper. Um, which has now looked at um, controversy and polarization. So more concretely, they consider opinions in this range minus one to one and assume that um, the mean opinion is zero. So it's like centered around zero. And in that case, the controversy index um, and the polarization index coincide. So we are just like summing over the squares of opinions. And then what they want to do is they want to minimize this polarization or controversy and in order to achieve that, they can select K nodes and make them moderate. So they consider two different versions of the problem. Um, either they can make the expressed opinions uh, zero of these nodes, or they can make them uh, make the innate opinions zero. So essentially, like you can just take like K users in the network and make them moderates, and your goal is to minimize the controversy. And they prove that the problem is NP-hard. Um, and then they give like uh, an algorithm which is called binary orthogonal matching pursuit, which is based on uh, like uh, sparse recovery, I think. And what they show is that this algorithm can actually indeed reduce the polarization um, quite a lot. And it performs similar to a greedy algorithm, which just takes like the users with highest expressed opinions and sets their opinion to zero. So it seems like the intuitive thing is a good thing to do, like taking the guys with like very extreme opinions and making them moderates, right? Uh, so this is the Matakos et al. paper. Then um, uh, Musco, Musco et al. It's the two Muscos, the two Musco brothers. They uh, considered the question of minimizing polarization disagreement and, polar and the polarization disagreement index. And while previously we have seen like discrete optimization problems where we like we're allowed to pick K nodes and make an intervention. What they say is like, now we're al allowed to change the innate opinions within a given budget and L1 distances. So this means like, um, now we might change the innate opinions for like many users, like essentially all, but we might, we can only change them like so much with respect to L1 distance. Um, and they show that these indices of polarization disagreement and so on are convex. Um, and because of that, um, these um, measures can be um, optimized in polynomial time. Um, so this shouldn't be surprising because I told you like the quadratic forms for these indices are positive semi-definite matrices. So the fact that uh, these are convex optimization problems is, is not super surprising. But what they also did, which is uh, quite interesting, uh, um, is they said like, okay, what if we don't just change innate opinions? What if we can change the graph topology? Um, and then they showed that this polarization disagreement index there is indeed convex with, change, with, with 
back to changes of the graph topology. Um, and again, because of that, we can use the standard convex optimization toolbox. Um, and indeed, what I also show is like, if we slightly change like how we weigh these terms, polarization and disagreement in this index, then the problem is not convex anymore. So it seems like um, if we want to change the network structure, the optimization problems change quite a lot. Um, okay, so I think this is like a pretty cool paper as well. Um, then next, there's a more recent line of work um, uh, where Chen and Ras started to ask the question, like, can we understand like formally the power of an adversary? Like, can we mathematically characterize how well or badly an adversary can do? So more formally, what they said is like, suppose there's an adversary who can change K and eight opinions arbitrarily much, right? So they said like, how much can that adversary increase the polarization or the disagreement? Um, and then they studied this mathematically. And what they showed is that after the adversary makes these changes, the new polarization increases by at most 3K. So in other words, the polarization increases linearly, at most linearly in the number of changes the adversary can make. Um, for disagreement, they got um, a similar bound, but it's like slightly more pessimistic. Um, so they said like the new disagreement increases by at most eight times the maximum degree in the graph times K. So again, it's this linearly, linear increase in, in K, the number of um, accounts the adversary can take over. Um, but it has this additional factor um, of the maximum degree, which can make the slope of the increase quite a bit steeper. And these are like mathematical bounds. Uh, so it's really like, this is really like an upper bound. You can't do that. Like, like the adversary can't be any worse. Um, and then they also like studied this uh, practically on real world data sets. And then they showed that actually like relatively simple greedy, like greedy algorithms and very simple heuristic, they actually get close to this linear increase in K. So, you know, maybe like the leading constant is slightly different, but Indeed, you can see like the more accounts an adversary can take over, um, the more the um, polarization or disagreement increases. And indeed, this is like a linear increase. So it doesn't like flat out uh, quite quickly, but it really like, uh, it really happens. You can really see these behaviors. Um, and then um, Gaitondi, Kleinberg and Tardosh um, looked at similar problems. They actually like made these bounds slightly tighter in certain parameter settings for K. And they also considered um, the setting when you don't just can take over K accounts, but they said like, what if we can change the innate opinions with respect to an L2 constraint? Uh, meaning that you might change like all opinions, but the L2 norm of the original and the new opinions should be at most R. Um, and then they show if, if like this difference is at most R, then the disagreement increases by at most r squared over four. And they also give an example that's like a, a tight bound. So you can, again, in this L2 setting, you can again characterize like how powerful such an adversary is. And then they also extend this um, for repeated disagreement where essentially like um, you, you kind of like run this FJ model multiple times in some way. Um, so this is also, I think, uh, a quite interesting direction of work to understand the power of adversaries, especially because um, we have seen um, a lot of like, you know, state actors trying to attack social networks, trying to like, you know, spread fake news and so on. So I think like this adversarial setting is uh, really interesting. And I think this is like a bit understudied still. So I think papers in that regard are, are really interesting. Um, Okay, but what, what we've seen so far, um, the interventions we have seen, they were always like kind of like one intervention in the sense like, you know, we have the original FJ model, then like an algorithm comes, makes some changes, we look at what does the network look afterwards. Or there's like an adversary who takes the initial network, adversary makes one change, uh, and then we see like what happens afterwards. But so you might say like in practice, uh, you wouldn't just assume there's like one change. You would assume there's like kind of like, it's going on all the time, right? Users updates their opinions, 
timeline algorithm does something, users do something, timeline algorithm does something back and forth, right? Um, and this is what um, Chitra and Musco studied in also a quite interesting paper um, where they studied this interplay between users and network administrators. Or instead of network administrators, you can think of um, timeline algorithms. Um, so uh, what they say is um, they propose a new dynamics model, which proceeds in iterations. And in each iteration, um, the users adjust their innate, uh, their expressed opinions according to the FJ model. And then there's a network administrator who can slightly adjust the network to minimize the disagreement, right? So like there's, for example, like a timeline algorithm, um, which changes how people interact, which changes the network structure. Um, and so now what you might say like, why does the network administrator want to minimize disagreement? Well, essentially the intuition is that like, you know, if you have like happy users, like if you have little disagreement, people are like happy, like they're happy to talk to their friends on the social network. So they have a better experience on the social network. Um, so this might be like the Facebook setting, right? On Twitter, you would assume that people are happier when they have more conflicts on the network because on people, everyone's like having flame wars all the time. So this paper is maybe working more in the Facebook setting. Um, okay, that's just a small joke, but uh, yeah. So essentially what they show in the paper is that experimentally, if you look at this kind of dynamics, the opinion dynamics setting, um, then indeed the polarization increases. Um, and they suggest that um, this explains why recommender systems increase polarization and introduce filter bubbles, because essentially like this minimizing disagreement step by the network administrator uh, is like prone to introduce filter bubbles because you only end up interacting with people who are like of very similar opinion to you. Um, and then they also study this um, from a practical point of view. Um, and they looked at two different networks like the Reddit network here um, where like the Y axis shows like the, the change in polarization and the X axis shows like how much network the network administrator can change the network. And you can see that indeed, the more changes the network administrator can make, the higher the polarization increases. Like here, it's like uh, up to like 120 times or so, right? And then additionally, um, on the Twitter data set, they look at the same. They also look at the decrease in polarization. Um, and they also show like uh, the polarization can increase quite a lot based on these dynamics. And then very interestingly, like on the, like here now we get like on the X, on the Y axis to change in disagreement. Um, and you can see on the Twitter network, indeed the network administrator is successful and indeed like reduces the disagreement. But in like the Reddit data set, it doesn't even work. Like in the Reddit data set, even like despite like the network administrator trying to like reduce the disagreement, in some parameter regimes, these like opinion dynamics kind of counter this effect by the um, network administrator uh, and just then the disagreement still increases. So this is like, it shows like, it's, it's really like complicated to, to build like good timeline algorithms with like the societal effects we want to have. Um, and yeah, so this uh, finishes my part of the talk. Uh, so I think I can now hand over to Aris and stop sharing. Uh, I think you're muted. Okay, can you hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, okay, and... Okay, uh, so, okay, so uh, Bruno and Stefan have done a great work um presenting this tutorial so so let, let me just conclude um uh, so is in, in in summary uh we saw uh this topic of opinion formation in social networks so this is a fairly active area and note that 
Uh, this is a topic of interest both in mathematics and aspects modeling, but also from the application point of view. So lots of work also on computational social science. So in this model, we review some common opinion formation model, in particular the Groot and Friedrich Johnson, and we, but and also some variants of these models, and also we discuss some properties of interest and uh, and and uh, yeah, uh, and then we saw how uh, different phenomena can emerge in these models. For example, how uh, polarization or, or echo chambers uh, can emerge. Uh, and then Stefan also talk about different computational aspects and this idea of interventions and moderating op opinions either by an adversary or by uh, by the timeline algorithms. And note that this was only about opinion formation, so we did not discuss misinformation and, and disinformation, which is currently a very big topic. Uh, so this would need a separate tutorial. Um, so let, let us note some challenges and some limitations. So know that uh, uh, the models we have discussed will be very difficult to validate experimentally. Uh, so for one, these models are very simplistic. So we, for example, consider that opinions is a real number between some interval zero, one or minus one, one, or we consider some very simple processes of, uh, for, uh, of uh, of updating opinions, for example, uh, a weighted average operation. So this is too naive and we cannot hope really uh, such a simple model to capsule like the complexities of real world. Uh, so even, even if uh, what the, the real world was as simple as this model suggests, then we would not be able to validate uh, our models because of uh, lack of data. So it's very difficult to obtain complete data uh, or very difficult to, to obtain unbiased data. For example, researchers use data mostly from Twitter, which is a very partial view. It's not representative. Not everyone is on Twitter. Uh, they do studies mostly focus on US politics. There are lots of bots and so on. Um, so this is a big issue. Uh, our models also uh, involve parameters that are difficult to estimate in practice, and therefore this gives us further difficulty in val validating the model. And many of these models um, uh, that we consider, uh, they use only the network structure and to, they ignore many other uh, aspects, like for example, the complexity of the human language when people communicate with each other. So from one side, this is good because it makes the model language independent, but also they lose a lot of information. So these are all things that one should keep in, in mind when working with these models. Uh, then Stefan already mentioned the aspect, the, 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 uh, the, the topic of, uh, of ethical considerations. So when we talk about interventions, is this uh, an, eth an ethical um, like uh, thing to do, right? Uh, so when we aim to reduce polarization and to increase diversity, we might have a very uh, noble uh, objective, but what might happen in practice? So is it ethical to tamper with uh, users' feed uh, or, to, or could these methods possibly introduce some other uh, aspects of manipulation? And one answer here that could kind of uh, drive this discussion is that uh, is to consider that uh, current timeline algorithms, current platforms, they are already employing these ideas of uh, tampering with uh, user feed, and they do it mostly with the goal of increasing engagement or monetization. And uh, so we are all subject to this type of timeline or time or filtering algorithms but without having any way of transparency. So what one could say here is that we would like to, uh, to give to the users of social media more control over what, uh, uh, what information they access uh, or how they choose who to, um, who to follow or who to comment uh, so that uh, they possibly have this more objective process of forming than one opinion. Uh, okay, and uh, finally, so the last slide uh, to, to conclude. So there are uh, obviously many directions for future work. 
so as we already discussed, so validating existing models is challenging. Um, so can we validate our models or if not, uh, can we uh, develop better models that uh, capture complexities of, of real world? Uh, okay, so how can we incorporate different modalities? So uh, during this tutorial, we talked about the graph, but in reality, there is not one graph. So there are many possible graphs. So, so there is the following graph, likes, posts, comments. So this, these are all kind of different modalities of data. And on top of that, we have complexity of, of human co communicating through a natural language process. Uh, then in our models, all users, they were uh, equivalent, so they were uniform. But of course, this is not true. People have different personality, they behave different, different backgrounds. So how can we uh, extend these models so that they capture the, these differences, these person, personalization aspects, or the different rules of users? I know that such a more advanced model would make validation even, even hard, hard, harder. harder. Um, okay, then we discussed about um, uh, methods that uh, increase uh, diversity or reduce polarization. So these interventions, this timeline algorithms, adversaries, and so on. So how can we make this more transparent? So this would answer some of the questions we have for the ethical considerations. Um, then uh, we talk about adversaries that uh, can change the opinion of certain users. So. Uh, which are the realistic models of adversaries? Uh, how can we obtain a better understanding of more complicated adversaries and timeline algorithms? And in many of the methods and these papers that Stefan presented, uh, the adversaries are operating in a single shot. So they make one modification of the network and then the network continues its operation. But in reality, there are feedback, feedback loops. So how can we model these? and how can we build algorithms that take into account this consideration? Uh, and finally, how can we defend social networks and social media platforms against attackers? So, so we think when we talk about uh, maximized diversity or other types of interventions, that one has a noble objective, uh, but in reality, there might be a malicious attacker who would like to manipulate uh, the crowd towards some direction. So how can we build mechanisms uh, to defend our networks against such attacks. So these are all very uh, interesting directions for future work. Okay, so I would like to stop here. Um, I would like to thank uh, Stefan and Bruno and of course all of the participants. So we are just a few minutes over time. Um, so we can uh, take any questions that you might have. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, are there any works about uh, adversaries that introduce new nodes in the network? I guess for taking over or introducing opinion instead of changing the opinion of uh, existing nodes, I guess it would make sense to just introduce new, new nodes and edges. Uh, so are there any works uh, in this direction? That we're aware of. Good question. New edges, yes. I have seen several of these talks, and maybe this uh, uh, later paper by Citra and Musco that Stefan talked about. It was not so much about introducing new edges, but it was more about uh, modifying the weights of existing edges. But there are also other works uh, like this Musco, Musco, and Surakakis. I think they consider uh, designing a new network. Um, okay, I have not seen work about introducing new uh, nodes. I don't know if uh, Stefan or Sidzing or, or, or Bruno have seen that. Yeah, so I can <clears throat> say like, uh, like at last year's NeurIPS, there's a, a paper by the Zheng group um, mm -hmm. where they talk about introducing edges and like I could imagine that there could be a reduction where like, you know, initially you have your original network, you add a few vertices, which don't like, which have like a range of opinions, but they, they are not connected to anyone with any uh, edges. And then you just add some edges to them. So there might be a reduction, but um, I haven't seen anything that like 
uh, like explicitly studies this question. So I think this could be a quite interesting uh, uh, direction actually, yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay. Um, any other question? Okay, but uh, we will be happy. I think we are now over time. We will be happy to receive an email. You can write us if you have some comment or question. So the slides will be available in the uh, website of the tutorial. Um, okay, so thanks everyone for participating. Okay, thank you for the nice. Yeah, and, uh, uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.